Good afternoon, everyone. Um, thank you for sticking to the lunch break and actually going back in time for, for this um, this talk. I think actually, initially when I uh, submitted my slides and to, to the um, organisers of this event, I actually thought it would be quite an interesting exercise in itself to see where I was placed. Um, data science, ultimately, the aggregation of data and the using of data is ultimately what informs the innovation changes which I'm a partner of. Um, but my background is actually in marketing services, professional services connected to marketing. So I spent a decade or so working in um, innovation businesses. About three years ago, set up at uh, Blackstone Innovation. I'm one of the founding partners and recently just won the accolade of the, the fastest growing startup in 2015 in the Sunday time. So um, we've gone from two people to 260 in the space of two, two, two and a half years. So we're doing something right, um, whether that's by chance or, or uh, on purpose. But um, I think with the innovation conferences like this, I think it's always interesting when you come because a forum like this naturally lends itself to people talking about the success of innovation, the impact innovation can have on the industry how to disrupt a market, how can to create breakthrough, what are those consumer insights which you can leverage to produce products, services, etc. I'm going to slightly reverse it and talk about the failure of innovation. I mean, one of the things which, um, one of the triggers which led myself and my business partners to set up Black Spawn Innovation was this, the failure rate within innovation is so high, especially when you look at the FMCG and consumer electronics um, arena. You're talking between a sort of 90 and 95 percent failure rate within products which are launched within 18 months of the life cycle of launch. They're out of the supermarkets or off shelf, and it just didn't feel good enough. Um, you know, I've been I've been involved in some successful innovation launches myself, also some failures. Um, I stand here with the luxury of the benefit of hindsight, being able to say this failed because of X or Y. Um, but actually, I think it's important to really understand why these why innovation is failing. And we've got a theory which I'll talk you through today as to why that is. Um, I think one of the sort of high case sort of high case studies which I'm going to talk about is actually Pepsi Raw and Coke Life. Um, those of you who are familiar with Pepsi Raw as a product, how many of you heard of the product? No, I think it is perfect. That's what sort I of hope the answer would be. Pepsi Raw launched in 2010. Um, it was a product which was designed to uh, leverage the whole sort of natural cola space. Um, effectively, it was Coke Life, but five years ago. It launched uh, within a year and multi million pounds worth of spend across Europe. It was failed and taken off shelf. Coke Life launched five years later, exactly the same space, a proposition which is almost identical, a slight twist on the name, maybe that had a big, big impact on, on its success. Um, but it succeeded. So, why is that? Why did something succeed today that failed five years ago? And I'll go through later down this, a few slides later why, why we think that is. I think data gathering. Um, I've heard sort of speaks from uh, talks from Gary from Host of Ireland earlier today. Um, I was sort of inspired by actually the amount of data out there. The challenge for brands today isn't actually collecting data, it's working out how to apply this data and actually apply it in a, in a, in a manner which will actually start to impact, impact their industry and category. I think. Right. So, what I'm going to talk today about for the next 10 minutes or so is just the actual application of some of, the, of, some of, of how you can use data for innovation purposes. So, some of our clients um, who we've been working with now for a couple of years, um, it's on a retained basis, um, Pepsi, Samsung, Vodafone, Mondale, Unilever, some big names in there, um, are very much sort of aligned with actually the approach we take to innovation. I think there's some very, very sort of sexy proofs we're working on in there, sort of defining the future of Pepsi from a product perspective. Um, Samsung, what does the future of mobile look like? What does the future of TV look like? Um, Unilever, how do we reframe the refreshment categories for ice cream and tea and start to leverage learnings from other markets? Um, so I think I won't spend too much time on this slide because um, there's, been a, there's been a lot more extensive um, content around what actually is big data. And many of you who work in professional services will have seen an agency or consultant produce a slide like this and sort of work their way through it. But I think the first thing to highlight within the marketing world is that there's a real misconception that big data means social data. Um, yes, a lot of the brands we work with are chasing that millennial, millennial audience and arguably 80% of what's produced on social channels is from this audience and demographic. But social is actually just one component, a vital component but one component. I think what's interesting is actually when you have a platform which allows you to aggregate multiple disparate data sources and actually start to enrich, enrich each other, you start to see some interesting stuff fall out. So I think news, uh, blogs, forums, etc. You, you don't have the same constraints you have on social media with 140 characters. People can be a lot more expressive and can talk in a lot more detail about products and category. Um, baskets, done Humby 20 years ago, recognised the value of actually understanding what people put in their shopping baskets. Um, recently had a valuation on their business, I think it was just over £1 billion. Um, sales data, 
where the data, so a lot of our clients, GSK being one of them, they're using uh, programmatic ad buying, uh, so actually how can you start to predict weather patterns and weather formats in certain markets. Travel data, online behaviour, so actually where, what are people doing online versus what they say they do, but, but actually one of, one, one of the most important things I think is a lot of the businesses we work with have a whole arsenal of data already, they just don't know what to do with it. Um, and that's very simple data, that can be sales data, media spend, that can be uh, distribution data. Um, and some of the case studies we've been, some of the projects we've been working on recently is actually how can we just take those three simple things, marry them up and work out the DNA of what's been a successful pro product launch in the last few years and actually what, are there any correlations as to why, why certain product launches have failed. So when I came into research 10 years ago, uh, or 10, 12 years ago, um, someone told me there was a job where I can sit and I can listen um, and then just reinterpret what I'm told and I can get paid relatively well for doing that. Um, I didn't believe it, so I came into research. Um, the first thing though, however, I was trained in was actually how to ask the right question. How to build discussion guides which are five pages long and so I could report back line by line. I asked this, people said this. It, I always felt there was a conflict actually with where my training started and um, for what reason it is I actually got into this industry. So I started facilitating focus groups, moderating workshops, building lengthy quantitative surveys, etc. Asking questions and asking people to respond. It never felt natural. Um, I then sort of went through a whole new training process of observation. I set up an agency about seven, eight, seven years ago, um, which did relatively well. The whole proposition was built around um, ethnography and immersion and actually understanding your consumers' lives, the products that sit within their lives by experiencing it firsthand. So how can you how can you, you experience, uh, sorry, uh, observe your audience in a manner which isn't breaking context too much. Um, it then moved on to actually a process of co-creation and community propositions. So we started to build software which um, allowed us to build panels of advocates of brands or categories so we could actually use ultimately the consumers of our products to help us start creating the next version of what these products look like. But actually what, what's quite interesting is, is with the last 10, 12 years I've been in this industry, it's, it's gone full cycle. And actually, it's just about listening now. So much content is being produced on a minute by minute basis um, across so many different channels that our job as researchers really should be to stop asking the question and to listen. I think the reason why there's the beauty of listening is that you don't have to ask a question. I've always had this theory in research that if I have to ask a question, I could probably with 90% accuracy measure what, what I think the response is going to be. Um, how do you find out the unknown unknowns? So going into a research process, just by asking the question, you're already starting to frame what you're going to find. There's no opportunity within that within that process to start unearthing things you never would have dreamt of. I think the, the, the I think it's important to understand about not the, the point about not breaking context. Um, I've sat in so many focus groups and workshops where I've asked people. When was the last time you drank a Pepsi? It was three months ago. Fantastic. You probably shouldn't have come through the screening process, but uh, great, you're here. Um, when was the last time you drank a Pepsi? It was three months ago. Fantastic. Can you tell me where you drank it, what the climate was like, who you were with, what they were doing, um, what you did after that, what you did before that? And they sit there and they look, look at me either blankly or they lie, and they just make it up. Um, so many decisions over the years have just been made based on asking people to recall the last time they consumed a certain product or service and how it made them feel. How can we get that feedback in the moment, that, mo that point in time when someone's drinking the Pepsi? So the content they'll produce on Twitter or Facebook or on certain forums or other, other information we can capture through other devices. Um, it's so important to understand where our product sits in the exact moment it's being consumed. And then finally, again, so how do you distinguish between real versus claim behaviour? The, the beauty of data and just listening is we're listening to what, what people are doing when they're actually doing it. So real behaviour, not claim behaviour. Many researchers, if you're in this room, if I'm in the room giving this talk, um, would have sat again in focus groups or workshops or facilitated communities or co-creation sessions where people have spoke about how they would never give their children um, X, Y, and Z because of the sugar content, because of the calories. The reality of it is, we know that's not true because yes, sales are declining, but they're still multi-billion pound businesses. What people say and what people do are very, very different things. Um, so actually, being able to understand 
what people are doing and when they're doing it is vital to research. So I think that the point now is just how big is big data. It can be as big or as small as, as you choose it to be. But I just want to give you a few stats which when I saw when they were produced and put in front of me a couple of years ago, I think they were put in front of me to scare me. Actually they inspired me um, and is what led us to set this, this business up. So every minute of the day there's four million search queries on Google. 2.46 million pieces of content produced and shared on Facebook. Over 275,000 pieces of unique content produced and set and distributed across Twitter. 216,000 images across Instagram. Over 204 million emails uh, sent. And three, over three, almost 3,500 images pinned on Pinterest. And Amazon are banking at $83,000 uh, a minute. Uh, 23,000 hours of connect connection over, over Skype. <coughs> it's really here just to sort of give you the idea of the enormity of what we're looking at. And, and actually, this doesn't even touch the surface. You know, some of the guys I heard speak earlier in this room talk about data far beyond even what I'm aware of. Um, the data which they're capturing and hosting here, here, here in Ireland, I think it was Gary which spoke about it. And this is data which we believe is very relevant to the consumer. It gives a very rounded understanding of who the consumer, the consumer is. I think when you look at some of these data sources here, you some of you may be looking to think, understand exactly how it can be used. Um, but just a few examples, so 4 million search queries on Google. So we worked with GSK, we worked with GSK, um, a project, a proof of concept project a couple of years ago, was to try and actually start to predict the outbreak of certain, not well, epidemics, it was cold, um, across the states. So what are the key symptoms people search for uh, when they feel a cold is actually beginning to emerge? Um, so we were actually able to, based on what people were searching for on Google and specific parts of the US, we were actually able to then predict uh, where the next outbreak would be. So it could help from a media spend perspective, um, so they could put adverts in the right place to align with their products, but more importantly, distribution. There was no waste of distribution. Uh, products were being, pharmaceutical products were being sent to the right places at the right time to, to ultimately sort of nip this, this epidemic in the bud. Um, Pinterest, I think, is really interesting. We do a lot of work across the, the baked goods range um, for, for Mondelez. Um, as a kid, if someone told me I'd spend four, hour, you know, four hours a day talking about chocolate and biscuits, I probably would have thought I'd go a line. But um, it does exist. Um, how can we steal ideas? Um, steal and then actually find the producers of these ideas to help us optimise them ready for a conglomerate like Mondelez to launch. Um, there's people at home as we speak, baking. Baking is a you know, great thing to bake. Off. A number of things have inspired it. They're producing the next sort of, uh, the next generation of products which are going to hit our shelf. Uh, they're far more agile, um, advanced uh, than, than businesses like Mondelez. So what are they producing? Uploading to Pinterest, which is then creating a behavior off the back of it. So I've uploaded a, a cookie of some sort, and it, we've then tracked that cookie, and what we've seen is uh, there's been a number of likes, retweets, shares, etc., which actually start to quantify the opportunity for us. So within a week, for a lot of for, for Mondelez, we were able to come up with 300 quantified ideas, which we were able to give a, a pretty accurate account of the impact we think it would have on the market. So gathering data is one thing. How do you actually start to interpret it and make sense of it? And Gary spoke a lot earlier about um, organisations like Uber who have just become obsessed with the end user. Um, that's my job, not to the same magnitude, but how can I actually take these millions and millions of different inputs and actually give our clients something which, uh, which is they can use? So some of our tools, so and how we look at data sets. So a recent example would be um, a tea project I'm currently working on. We purchased a data set of just over 200 million conversations um, across multiple channels. Where do you even start? I think as researchers, you can be quite overwhelmed just by having um, 12 manuscripts come back from a focus group, let alone a spreadsheet or a number of spreadsheets which contain that much content. So we decided let, let's break it down into two, two key areas. So we've created this inside out and outside in analysis. So the inside out analysis, I'll give you the example of what that looks like on the next slide, but it's how as a brand do we talk about our product and how does that marry up versus how, our, how the consumers are talking about our product. So that can be anything from the attributes of our brand, from the claim errors we, we produce for advertising, <coughs> Um, the refresh, the, the trends which we're actually creating and innovating around, how are they actually performing across uh, what people are talking about? And then the outside in analysis is the complete reverse of that, is what are those naturally, naturally sort of surfacing themes of conversations or clusters of conversations which emerge from, from the conversation? 
Um, we then go through a process of um, finding the influencers who are driving those conversations. And this isn't the aggressive friend collectors, this is the people who are producing content which is relevant to the to market or product, to the category or product we're working on. Um, and inviting them into the community uh, or private community so that they can help us actually start to create. So when I, I mentioned earlier that we steal ideas, that's actually not quite true. We, we find the people producing them and then they help us actually build that and get credit, credibility for actually when it gets launched uh, with our brands. Um, the rapid innovation engine I've spoken about, so quickly getting to 200 ideas and quantifying um, the opportunity there. Uh, but also some, some more interesting some interesting areas we do around ingredient and benefit tracking. So I think in the beverage category, any of you that work within beverages will see that the whole conversation around beverages now has come is around benefits. So what are the benefits connected to the champion ingredient which make up that product? So whether it be detox or pre-tox, or does it help me sleep or does it help my immune system? Um, we can actually start, we're actually now tracking benefits and understanding which products um, should say what basically um, because of the ingredients they contain. So this is just an example of um, five trends which uh, one, of the five, one of the five businesses I've put up earlier um, have, have in their organisation. And it also tell you that 80% of their innovation focus and media spend was spent around three, these three trends which are all either at best inclining or the majority in decline. Um, and what I mean by inclining and declining is over a two year period we looked at all of the conversations which took place around these, these five trends. Um, and we have produced a volume over time graph of con volume of conversation and the sentiment of that conversation. So we were astonished, as was our client, that 80% of their spend is actually around declining and inclining areas within, within their category. The two areas which are showing to an extent it's some exponential growth, uh, sort of predominantly around health and wellness and experience, uh, are being ignored. Um, so suddenly we put this in front of, uh, we managed to get up to sort of the C, C level suite, put it in front of them. There's been over the last six months a complete shift in the focus of the business. A lot of projects which are sort of midway through have been scrapped, and the focus is now being on the trends which we're actually predicting. We're actually proving the upsurge in conversation around them. We've actually started to predict their propensity to scale, but also the market and go on going. So, what does this sort of outside in analysis actually look like? So, I use health as a perfect example and talk about some sort of subcategories of the health conversation. Um, so we look at so this, this, this almost it's almost like British politics, it's a race for the middle. It's, if you imagine you've got a spectrum of healthy on one side and indulgent on the other. They've always, as products, to an extent had to sit in exclusivity. And now what we're starting to see and have seen over the last couple of years is this sort of race for brands to start delivering products which deliver against both health and indulgence. And one of the prime examples that has been is sort of the upsurge in popcorn, popcorn sales over the last couple of years has sort of risen by 138%. Um, the evolution of the calorie conversation, I think it's been really interesting looking at sort of three, four year data sets to understand how this conversation on calories is changing. It started with high cal, then it went to mid cal. Um, Coke Life launched sort of off the back of this mid cal conversation. Pepsi were far too early, hence the failure. Um, it then went to no cow or low cow, and actually the conversation is shifting away from that now. So imagine if in a year's time you'll look on shelf and you'll see products which will have claims like minus 20 calories or minus 50 calories, because they'll contain specific ingredients which actually expedite the calorie burning process. Where did this idea come from? It came from conversation which is already taking place. So people are starting to drink specific teas like matcha, for example, I'm not sure if anyone's heard of matcha, but uh, they're drinking teas because they expedite the calorie burning process. So how can we start to incorporate those ingredients to some of our products where well, we can actually change the whole conversation on the shelf to be moving away from sort of this zero or low calorie conversation which is quite saturated. And I, sp I spoke a bit earlier about this sort of the benefit led proposition. So even with the work we're doing with Pepsi now, it's about looking, all, looking back at the the reason why every single ingredient sits within a product to understand what benefit it, it, can, it can give to the consumer from a health perspective. Um, I spoke a bit about identifying influencers. Um, again, to re reiterate, we're not after aggressive friend collectors here. We, our algorithms measure across these conversations who are the people who have significant reach, so followers, um, activity, so what activity or behaviour are they producing with the back of content uh, which they're putting out there. So, the likes, shares, retweets, etc. start to give us an understanding of actually how, whether people will consume products and content like this, but also how they're engaging the, their communities. So whether that's over a, I think a lot of people can create a spike in conversation, um, especially across social media with the right promotional tool. Um, sustaining the conversation is very different. And we're looking for people 
um, who can engage an audience and sustain a conversation for, for a lengthy period of time. Um, here's an example of, of course, I'm probably running out of time, but um, just some of the work we're doing at the moment on the tea, on the tea category. Um, a number of ideas which fall out of the process have been three days. Um, innovation processes would traditionally take you know, a month, two months, three months in the FMCG sector. We're getting to raw concepts within three to four days. And then, not, and then beyond that, we're starting to quantify the opportunities. So how many conversations across the last 30 days, 60, 90, wherever we decide to measure it, have taken place around a subscription service for tea, for example? or uh, first, my first tea, the equivalent of the sort of baby frappuccino which exists within coffee for, for the younger audience. Um, and then we can, once we've got this data, we can actually start to predict the propensity for its impact to market. And what this is doing is it's, it's not just shortcutting the innovation process, but shortcutting the decision-making process for a lot of our clients as well, and arguably the spend, because they don't, they now no longer need to go into sort of the traditional basis, uh, testing, etc., to understand whether something, whether there's an appetite for something. Um, I've said a lot, maybe very little, um, but there's one thing that um, I think maybe you should probably leave with today. Um, from a research perspective, um, I think, well, I firmly believe, as uh, my firm, that firmly comes from, a failure comes from having to ask the question. Um, we're here to just listen to that. Content is being also organically produced. Um, not just content, but data is being produced um, everywhere <coughs> around us. Um, as long as we can aggregate the right data and work ahead and make sense of it, no longer as research shows do we ever need to ask the question again.